The Confederacy of Invent Systems was technically controlled opposition because Darth Sidious was behind its creation. Even though the Separatists caused had some real and justified grievances against the Republic, it was only made up of a few hundred worlds, most of which had low populations, low economic and industrial outputs. The Separatist Parliament that drew representatives from these worlds therefore held very little true power. And with Dooku and Grievous gone now, all you have left was the Separatist Council. The Council was made up of a collection of senior leadership from the largest corporations within the Confederacy. You had San Hill, chairman of the Intergalactic Banking Claim, which essentially controlled and minted the Galactic Credits and provided loans to fund the Confederacy's military. You had Newt Gunray, Viceroy of the Trade Federation, one of the largest trade, mining, and energy corporations in the galaxy. Then you had Wat Tambor from the Techno Union and Pongo the Lesser of Gene Ocean Industries and the Stalgazan Hyde. These two groups provided the manufacturing might that created the separate destroyed army. These were the essential members of the Confederacy that actually provided the majority of the material that would fund the war effort. Without them, the Confederacy has no droids, no ships, no money, no trade, no communication, and no chance at winning. Now, General Grievous had attempted to hide the Separatist Council at the end of the war on the planet of Utapu, but shortly before he died, Darth Sidious ordered Grievous to send them to the planet of Mustafar, where they would take refuge in the Kleger Corp mining facility. After the death of General Grievous at the hands of Obi-Wan Kenobi, the Separatist Council would take command of what remained of the CIS military and try to salvage what they could of the Outer Rim sieges. But before they were able to come up with a viable strategy, Palpatine sends Darth Vader to execute them all. This would essentially destroy the last links he had to the failed Separatist uprising. Before we continue today's episode, a word from our sponsor, Ownersaber.com, the premier manufacturer of lightsabers. Ah! The premier manufacturer of awesome lightsabers like this dueling blade, which is light and easy to swing around, it's great for practicing those finishing moves you want to pull off on your opponents. They also have premium Xenopixel lightsabers like this baby. This is the first on notice. The ignition is different. This is a Obi-Wan Kenobi replica, and there's an LED strip that runs right through this, and you can program it to do all sorts of cool things. There's also a Xenopixel soundboard on here so you can get all sorts of cool sound effects. If this sounds like something you guys would be interested in, please check out the description down below. You can also follow Onasaber.com on Instagram and YouTube. Look out for their free lightsaber giveaways. In today's video, we're gonna take a look at what happens to these separatist corporations once the Confederacy loses the war. Most of these corporations actually have very close ties to the Sith, whether it's Plagueis, or uh, Darth Sidious. And so this video should be a warning for all of you guys out there who are potentially thinking about working with the Sith Lord. The death of Sand Hill as chairman of the intergalactic banking clans really didn't change that much. The banking clans had already lost its independence in the last year of the Clone Wars when it proved it was no longer capable of remaining neutral in the conflict. It was never neutral. It was always in the pockets of the Sith. The Supreme Chancellor's office would take direct control of the banks as a result. This, of course, was a Sith orchestrated incident that was supposed to allow Palpatine to take control of the banking clans with the stated plan of stabilizing the Republic economy and currency. Palpatine didn't like the idea of an independent banking system and would use the IGBC to control monetary policy, print credits, and raise funds for his massive imperial military. And so during the Imperial era, the banking clans would become naturally the largest lender to the Galactic Empire's military. It would also become the primary creditor for the Empire's restructured currency. The Moons would maintain control over the day-to-day -day activities of the bank, but Imperial forces were garrisoned on every IGBC stronghold, and that was because they wanted to protect this very important financial infrastructure. The Techno Union was a commerce guild that was responsible for producing the lion's share of the war material used by the Separate Destroyed Army. Its foreman was Wat Tambor, and the company actually had many subsidiaries functioning beneath it. 
like Bactoid Armor Workshop and Blast Tech Interviews. Even Quad Drive Yards at one point was a part of the Techno Union, but then there's this whole situation where the Nemoidians carried out a hostile takeover of the Trade Federation by killing all of the Quadi execs. That led to Quat, which is where Quad Drive Yards is located, uh, to pulling out of the Techno Union. The Techno Union also had its own mining companies like Kleger Corporation, which we talked about before. It ran the mineral extraction operation on Mustafar. Now, after the war, the Techno Union was more or less dissolved. A lot of its mining infrastructure, for instance, was given to the Mining Guild. The Troy foundries were either scrapped or repurposed for other heavy manufacturing. There really wasn't much of a market for killer battle droids anymore. The horror of the Clone Wars had left much of the populace with a strong anti-droid sentiment. And the rest of the infrastructure was handed off to Senior Fleet Systems. This was a relatively unknown boutique starship manufacturer prior to the Clone Wars. But after the war, it would land a massive next generation multi-purpose fighter contract from the Empire. They would develop the TIE Fighter. The Trade Federation was extremely important to the Confederacy of Independence Systems. This massive interstellar shipping and trade conglomerate was a power player within the Galactic Senate and maintained one of the largest commercial fleets in the entire galaxy. During the Clone Wars, the Trade Federation would refit their merchant fleet for war, and they would also use their expertise to basically streamline the Confederacy's logistics. When New Gunray was killed, the Trade Federation would be nationalized. A good percentage of their commercial fleet was scrapped. And the rest of their assets were either sold or redistributed to new pro-Empire corporations. Because of the very visible action of the Trade Federation during the blockade in Naboo and later on during the Clone Wars, the Trade Federation brand name had lost all of its appeal and power in the core regions. It was considered a pariah company run by the criminal New Gunray. To make matters worse, during this transitional period, a lot of assets were seized by a former Trade Federation employee known as Arson Crassus. This actually happened a lot to companies that were being dissolved during this time period. The Corporate Alliance is one of the lesser known members of the Separatist Councils. It was actually one of the largest uh, commercial firms in the galaxy, and like a lot of these other corporations, it had its own defense fleet which it bought with them when it joined the Clone Wars effort. The Corporate Alliance was known for fielding the NRN-99 Persuader class droid enforcer, and it also had the Recusant class light destroyer. When the Clone Wars ended, the Corporate Alliance would mostly be absorbed within the Empire in a process known as imperialization. Those entities that were not related to military production or were simply just still independent of the Empire would seek refuge within the corporate sector in the northeast quadrant of the galaxy. The corporate sector authority would eventually establish their own territory and the Galactic Empire would station troops on those borders to keep them in check. Next up, we have the Stalgassen Hive. Geonosian society was separated into different hives, and the Stalgassen Hive was the largest of them all. It was headed by Queen Karina the Great, and Pagal the Lesser executed her will. The Geonosians would suffer the cruelest fate of all of the members of the Separatist High Council. And that's because the only thing the Stalgassen Hive brought to the table was labor. And I guess just like here in this world, uh, labor is pretty powerless in the Star Wars galaxy. With the death of the Geonosian leadership during the Clone Wars, a new Archduke and Queen would eventually be chosen, but the Geonosians were still basically under the rule of the Empire. Sure, they could control their day-to-day -day operations, but everything from where they worked, how they worked, and how they bred was controlled by the Empire. Due to the hive nature of the Geonosians, the Empire really only had to control the leadership cast in order to control the entire hive. The Geonosians would be forced to work on the Death Star construction as essentially free labor. Thousands of bugs would die due to the harsh work conditions, and once the Death Star's outer shell was completed and the hyperdrive was installed, Grand Moff Wilhuff Tarkin, of course, ordered the sterilization of the entire planet. Approximately 100 billion Geonosians were killed, making it one of the largest genocides in galactic history. The Commerce Guild was a conglomerate that was composed of several large different corporations, ranging from agricorps to shipbuilders and service providers to arms providers. 
The guild was founded by these corporations to protect their holdings from more hostile competitors and also bandits. Despite being a direct competitor of the corporate alliance, the Commerce Guild would eventually join the Separatist cause and pledge support to Count Dooku. President Shu Mai would supply the CIS military with the DSD-1 Dwarf Spider and the OG-9 Homing Spider droids. The guild would continue to operate post-Order 66 even after the death of its president. The Mining Guild, which was a part of the Commerce Guild, would strike a deal with the Empire to provide massive amounts of raw materials for the production of new ships, and would remain an important partner for the military-industrial complex. Solus based Soro Sub Corporation would also pledge allegiance to the Empire, and Palpatine would more or less forgive the Solusans for joining the Confederacy during the Clone Wars. Still, Palpatine would send a large Imperial garrison to watch over the planet's rich mineral deposits and refineries. The planet Solus would play an important role during the Galactic Civil War. Next up, we have the Hyper Communication Cartel led by the Aqualish Senator Poe Nudo. He was probably one of the least known members of the Severus Council and at the same time one of the most important. You see, the main form of communication for the entire galaxy was the Holonets, and this was a Republic government controlled infrastructure. The hypercommunication cartel's first goal was to create an alternative to the Holonet. This would be called the Shadow Feed. Count Dooku would use this alternative comm network to rally the Outer Rim people towards his cause. And then during the war, the hypercommunication cartel also assisted Separatist intelligence by trying to intercept Republic military communications. Post Order 66, there is no reason for Palpatine to keep this cartel around anymore. During the Clone Wars, the Confederacy of Invent Systems would oftentimes target planets which had two or more species living together in relative peace. The idea was to increase tension between different species and cultures and then cause a civil war to erupt, at which point the CIS would enter the fray, providing military support for one side of the civil war. By backing the winner, they would get another member state for their confederacy. Mon Cala was one of these worlds who had the very social and shallow water dwelling Mon Cala and the xenophobic and deep ocean dwelling Korans. Now the Korans of the Mon Calamari have always had tension, but for the most part they lived together peacefully, usually under Mon Calamari rule. When the planet was at peace, Mon Cala was one of the premier ship building planets in the galaxy. The two species worked together quite well when they could. The Korans were experts at deep ocean excavation and the Mon Cala were excellent ship designers. The CIS would seek to destabilize Mon Cala by giving funds to the relatively unknown Koran Isolation League. They believed that Koran should have self-determination. They also believed that the current leader, Prince Lee Char, was too young to inherit the throne. With an influx of new funding, the Koran Isolation League would balloon in size and declare war on the Mon Cala, starting a civil war. The CIS, in return, would gain the valuable shipbuilding experience of the Korans. They would create a new company known as the Free Dock Volunteer Engineering Corps. This company would be responsible for building several of the CIS Navy's capital ships, including the Providence-class Dreadnought and the Subjugator-class Heavy Cruiser. In the middle of the Mon Cala Civil War, the Republic would intervene with a Jedi-led clone army. The Jedi would end up uncovering a CIS plot to destabilize the planet. The Koran Isolation League would lose popular support from its base amongst the Koran people. And Mon Cala would be united underneath the rule of Prince Lee Char. After the death of its leader, Senator Tykes, the Koran Isolation League would fade away with the rise of the New Order. The Korans and the Mon Cala would stand together in the face of future Imperial brutality. So as you can see, uh, most of the corporations and organizations that joined the Separatist Alliance ended up falling apart, especially if they didn't have you know, vital infrastructure, resources, or technology that the Empire might need. Which is why you should never uh, join an idea started by a Sith Lord. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. And as usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.